but last spring I had to go over to Anchorage to attend a uh, bear uh, safety training or train the trainer. I, I train the bear. I do the bear safety training on our district at Forest Service here. And uh, while I was over in Anchorage, a mutual friend kind of set me up with Tom Griffin, uh, who's the bear manager at McNeil River. And I'm sure if you came to this meeting, you're probably aware of what McNeil River is. It's this world famous site, you know, one of the most highly managed uh, sites uh, for uh, bear viewing in, in the world, probably. And uh, anyway, he's been the manager there for four years and has worked there for 14, is that right? So you got them on first, know them by first name basis and everything. He worked with the, the famous uh, uh, Larry Allmiller. And anyway, uh, I want to thank Fish and Game. Uh, we had offered to pay his way here uh, after you know, meeting you last spring. I just thought it'd be the perfect uh, presentation to, to show people, uh, you know, getting the actual manager for Mc, from McNeil to, to talk about it. But also, uh, we're having a lot of bear issues in town right now, and you do bear awareness uh, and bear safety uh, uh, training all around Anchorage. Well, we're killing a lot of bears in this town in, in recent years uh, by leaving garbage out, attracting them, uh, making them habituated, and then people oftentimes taking it uh, into their own under their own power and, and killing bears. Uh, but anyway, regardless of how they're killed, uh, they're attracted to the town by garbage. So it was a perfect mix. And even though we had offered to pay for your travel, uh, Fish and Game uh, stepped up because uh, they saw the opportunity to get uh, him into the schools and give this training to uh, school kids uh, about uh, how to live in bear country you know, uh, safely. And uh, so anyway, it's worked out just great. So thanks for coming, Tom, and uh, look forward to your talk. Yeah, thanks for, for having me. Um, I just a little bit about myself too. I, like Milo said, I've been at McNeil for 14 years. I was hired as an entry level worker there by Larry All Miller, and then I kind of worked my way up and now been manager for the last four years. Um, but I've been really lucky to work with this particular resource. It's a fantastic place uh, for watching wildlife. But I came to Alaska originally via Colorado. I was working down there for the Forest Service seasonally in a 1039 capacity. And uh, I transferred up to Southeast Alaska and worked out of Wrangell and Haines, um, Juneau, Sitka, and Ketchikan. So I, I kind of worked around a climate like this for about 10 years, 10 seasons anyway. And then I came over here to South Central 14 years ago. So it feels like home to me here in Cordova because <laughs> uh, this climate right here, I, I'm kind of familiar with it. Um, so I, I miss the trees too. We have a beautiful place over at McNeil, but we don't have those big trees. Um, not as rainy, but it's, it's a little chilly over there at times. But I put together a little slideshow. Um, I'm going to start off with just a little bit and try a little bit of this technology here. Um, just to kind of click ahead, I'm just going to go right forward, right to this map right here. And these, these little icons, these primary colored icons, the triangles and the circles and the red squares, just represent the state uh, game refuges, sanctuaries, and critical habitat areas. And you can see we manage about 3 million acres of land in Alaska total. So we're about the size of state parks. Um, but if you can see those three red squares, those are state game sanctuaries. Um, way out there in the Bristol Bay area is Round Island, uh, where the big wall of Colorado is, which is an amazing place to go if you ever have a chance to get there. It's kind of expensive to get there. You gotta go to Dillingham and take a small plane to Togiak and get a boat across but a pretty amazing place. And then way over there in Southeast on Admiralty Island, an area that's co-managed with the Forest Service. It's um, called Pack Creek. And uh, it's the state calls the, their area ca is called San Clyster Game Sanctuary. Um, so right in the middle there on the top of the Alaska Peninsula is McNeil River over there in Kamishak Bay, about 100 air miles from Homer and takes about one hour to get over there from Homer. Um, so most people fly uh, seat fare over from Homer and stay with us for four days guided. But a uh, little bit of definition about wildlife game sanctuaries. Um, there's uh, again Round Island where there's a, a large walrus haul out, three to four thousand uh, walrus at a time, stellar sea lions, and a lot of seabirds, kitty wakes, murres, and um, puffins. Uh, so that's a neat spot. And again, Sam Price and McNeil River is both primarily bear viewing, even though there's other wildlife to see there as well. Um, every year we, we count um, a lot 
of animals. I count a lot of bears, among other wildlife. <laughs> and uh, we put out an annual report. And it, it usually shows up online under our state game sanctuary uh, label and under the Fish and Game website. So like the 2013 report won't be out till 2014. So we wait for some fishery data to come back in and get that out. So I put that out in September, and then my season is done. I'm done with McNeil on September 30th, and now I do bear and moose safety around Anchorage. And I was invited here. I've been spent two days here in Cordova talking to the, the school kids, which has been great. Um, I get to go back to the elementary school tomorrow, and I spent two solid days at the high school. So it's been a, a nice experience here in, in Cordova. Uh, management issues and, and other refuges um, statewide is trying to keep refuges clean, especially road access refuges. Um, we're up here in uh, Goose Bay. We had a, a fairly large dumping site, and it doesn't, it doesn't do our habitat well, and there's a lot of contaminants being dumped in there. So we've recruited uh, the National Guard to help us clean up these sites uh, for public use, and we try to keep access and maintain access uh, where it's appropriate. You can see that CXD potty going in out there at Ruffrockton's Lake. Um, so, so we do some of this kind of work in refuges and sanctuaries and try to maintain that habitat. Out in McNeil River, a primitive area, we guide 10 people a day or bring 10 people a day with us every day. We go out to count the bears and they come via lottery. So we see uh, about 200 people a year, give or take. And uh, so we have about 185 regular four-day permits available and up to 57 standby permits and um, so we, we have a total of 257 permits that we can distribute um, but actually feet on the ground can range anywhere from 150 to 200 depending on weather and who actually makes it out there um, so here's a little picture of the falls out here with uh, the bears fishing in peak season July oh, there, there, oh, oh, there. there we go I can um, well, in some some cases, um, you see quite a few bears. I can move that photo. Uh, which slide I can find? Here we go. I can try that again. There's a little delay. Let's see if I can do that. Um, yeah, let's roll back where it's good and get the going. Go back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, just to kind of give you a sense of where we are uh, right here. So, again, we're 100 air miles from Homer, uh, right over, you can see the map over there. And people fly into Ketchumac Bay and come in at high tide only. So, that's part of the thing about McNeil, is we're not on a lake like Brooks or some other locations. So, you have to come in at high tide. You need a minimum of 14.4 feet of water to get those planes in and out on floats. So we have a small window to get that plane in and out. And as you know, when the weather picks up and the winds pick up and the, and the ceiling drops, planes don't get in. So it's, it's a tough, uh, people like it when they get in it on time. They don't mind it so much if they don't get out on time. <laughs> but that's a pretty common uh, occurrence. Right above us um, is the refuge, a McNeil River State Game Refuge. And you can see we're right on top of Katmai National Park right here. And this land over here is actually state land, that little block of land there. It's called the Kamishak Special Use Area. Uh, but it's over there on the top of the Alaska Peninsula. So I'll try this one more time, see if I can. Oh, too many, that's okay. Um, over here, and we've got a few pictures of the sanctuary. You can see um, the, the cook shack here down below with the tent sites. So people, uh, Alaskans pay $150 spend four days with us to go out and do bear for four days and they bring their tents and they go shopping and bring their coolers so they bring their own food and they store everything in that cook shack and really the key to the success of McNeil where no one has ever been injured by a bear uh, nor a bear by a human is that bears don't get food from us there's no food rewards that's the real secret to it all and consistency we have that tent a day we hike the same trails or the same same routes day in day out and we behave in a consistent manner in front of those bears and so hence that's kept us pretty safe all these years um, so again the cook shack is where all the food is stored and uh, we're going to hike out about two miles every day to the falls and 
you know, in June, we, we hiked out to uh, a place called Mixit, out in this arena, and way over here to McNeil Falls. This is a lagoon that's kind of barricaded by a spit um, that we'll see in another picture. So the, again, the visitor program, 185 regular permits, 57 standby permits a year. Usually, like this year, we saw 900 and, ooh, 964 applicants, I think, um, total. Uh, the lottery is weighted toward Alaskan, so 65% of the initial draw is uh, our Alaskan residents who are state agency, and we, we give uh, Alaskan priority. 35% is non-residents, so that's lower 48 and the rural combined. Um, special access permits are, are kind of based on uh, criteria. A, um, a uh, panel meets and, and decides on the merit of certain applications for uh, science and education. So you can see our primitive camp here in the middle of a pretty wild area. Um, so we've got a couple outhouses out back, and we've got uh, staff quarters here, the front manager's quarters right there in the office and a tool shed, and then the public use area there, that uh, cabin to the far right. And every day we hike out to see those bears in July, but only in July, really, in part of August, do people go out to the McNeil Falls. In June, a lot of people prefer to come to Mixit and watch bears graze on sedge and fish in Mixit Creek, the little creek out there. Now every day, we, we we're counting uh, bears on the hour. We do systematic counts, and we kind of record the zone we're in and how many bears are in view and where the bears are. And so we also keep track of an individual bear count every day. How many males, females, maternal females, juveniles, and unknowns with cubs that we see every day. So we, that's more of a subjective, um, a softer data set because it's based on your ability to identify individuals. Uh, which is not too hard with the big startup males, but it gets a little more difficult with well furred, even looking bears. That can be a little more of a challenge. Um, but the hourly counts are very good. And very simply, we put together graphs. And today, uh, Mr. Westing had his kids uh, using some data and making graphs, just like this one in, uh, in the high school, which was pretty impressive uh, since I, I wasn't doing that until I was a freshman in college. <laughs> Uh, but pretty amazing that you're here these days. These are individual bear counts, and this shows uh, the last uh, total number of bears seen in 2011 was 104. This year, the total number of individual bears identified was 95. Uh, we also we have a, another measure. We call it the bear threshold criterion, and what we do is we take the seven highest days with the seven highest counts of the fall, and we take a mean. And that average is makes this list right here. And you know, if I was to update this to 2013, that line way up top there, that would come right down to the to about 50, right above the base mean of that bear threshold criterion, which is a very good number of bears to be seen at one time. If we're averaging 50 bears on our seven highest days, that's a that's a lot of bears. So it's uh, things are pretty good these days. Um, how do you arrive? You come via float plane and at high tide, and uh, hopefully it's not too windy and the, the plane can land out there. We do get a lot of wind in Candace Rock Bay. We see some pretty good water out there at times. Uh, that east wind comes in from the GOA and brings in some systems uh, right on up the chain through Shell Shellacoff Strait. So it's pretty common in that part of the world. Now this summer, I don't know about you guys, but I was wearing shorts in June and July, and August was fairly normal. But June and July were really exceptional uh, in terms of weather. Oops, let's do it again. The map broke faster than what we got there. Sorry, I don't, I'm not sure. What back up? Just back up one, yeah. Um, so again, tent camping um, in the camp. And uh, you can kind of see it's a small campground. And um, there's a sauna on the, on the other side of that cook shack. And people bathe in the sauna for the bathhouse. So to a backcountry user, McNeil is like a resort. So there's a cook shack and there's propane and there's a sauna and they just love it. And you know, other than the cost of getting there, the, the, the fees are reasonable. Alaskans are with us for $37.50 a day. Um, out of state folks are with us for almost $100 a day. Um, but um, 
for non-backcountry users, this is a pretty rustic, uh, challenging environment. Uh, folks who don't camp too regularly. So you see some different experience out there. Let's see if this can work. Hold on. There we go. So you can see inside a cook shack right here where all the food is when people kind of prep. Um, those big, they look like gasoline cans back there. Those are water canisters. So people go down and get creek water every day and they filter, they pump their water out there. So uh, there's uh, six propane burners uh, behind this picture right here, a big wood stove. We provide the split firewood. Um, people select their own kindling on the beach and they, they can dry their gear out inside the rafters there when they get wet. So a cook shack is really nice in a place like the Alaska Peninsula. Now every day we come down to this location at about 9.30 in the morning and we have a meeting. Um, try this again. Oh, people get that camera gear. You can see these pictures are dated because this, this is a film camera. Oh boy. And a film. <laughs> There's a thing called film. And many years ago, even, when, even 14 years ago when I started, it was amazing because it was actually, I miss it because everyone, all the photographers would, would line up and they would they would talk this foreign language we call it FSOC, you know, <laughs> like Japanese or FSOC. And so every all they all communicated. I got an F sixty four. I got a Sony size rule sixteen. They were just always now everybody now they're just quiet. You just hear everything bracketed. They they hit that button and it fires three times. And there's less conversation about what uh, FSOC or aperture they're using. So anyway, they're all digital these days. There's a few film users out there, a few holdouts. Um, but every day we, we meet after that, we come down and ch chat with you in the morning about nine o'clock, talk about the tides and the weather, and we discuss what time we're gonna leave, 10, 10.30. So we come down there with our coffee and then we come down at 10, 10.30 and we gather up the troops and we give you a safety talk. You can see Drew over on the far left, the guy with the red beard, and he's been with us for four years now. He's great, really lucky to have him. And then on the far right, there's a guy there with a, a, a tan vest with a green sleeve with a white beard, and that's Larry Allmiller. And I, I've been able to get him back almost every year as a volunteer to sub for staff, but he has a full-grown adolescent right now, so he is sticking close to home for a year or two. <laughs> We're gonna see him in another year or two, once maybe college starts, but we'll see. Um, so I was really fortunate uh, to have Larry as a mentor even though I, I was viewing bears down in Ann Ann Creek uh, near Wrangell prior to McNeil, but um, I, I learned quite a, I got quite an education working for Larry. Uh, so I was very fortunate to come in as a tech three at McNeil River um, 14 years ago. But, oh, let me see if I can do this a little bit. If I can turn it off. So we get ready to, to leave in the morning and uh, oh, and I guess as we go out, I'm just kind of jumping ahead here a little bit. We kind of identify species all day long. And so we talk about other things besides bears. So we even talk about Senecio, this nice uh, flower that grows in the sandy nutrient poor beaches along the way. Uh, so we, we keep track of first blooms and things of that nature, whether it's, it's the Kamchatka rhododendron, which is a, a beautiful flower that grows on the, on the conglomerate wall out there along with the dwarf fireweed and many other flowers. So we do look at other things besides bears and uh, flora is, uh, is pretty popular actually. Um, let's see if I can, oh, I just did it again. Sorry, this is, I'm, this is a little different. Let me see here, tracks in the mud. Um, you can see that on the way out we wear hippers because we walk in some stick, sticky mud. This is the good mud. And then we walk in that peanut butter-like mud, that stuff that's not mixed yet. And that stuff is a little challenging. So we always have hip boots as a mandatory uh, part of your equipment list. Um, lots of little sedges out there, like this, maybe this, this might be an Eleocerus, or I'm not even sure, someone could probably identify that. Um, the little tiny sedges out there, the bears pull them with their front incisors. And there's even a subspathophia that grows out there, so we see three to 500 branch at a time in June out on the uh, mud flats. So when we don't see the diversity you see here, but uh, we, we do see some interesting birds from time to time passing through. Oh, and there it is again. Sorry, I, I don't know why it's doing that. That's perfect. It's, it's yeah. Um, 
to go back to that. And then if we do see other species like the tree, tree swallow, we try to um, make mention of it. And very simply, uh, if we can't identify something, we try to get a photograph and go back and take a close look at that photograph. And we do see some unusual birds. Um, I had a Palmerine Jaeger um, about a year or two. Uh, we've been seeing some, some interesting uh, terns um, out there as well, um, here and there. But we, every now and then we'll see one of those seabirds that is kind of blown in um, and we don't see it very, very often. We don't see turnstones very often and we saw some black turnstones this year, things of that nature. So we make, we make uh, those observations, we track all that stuff on our walkable wildlife. Uh, so are you seeing Caspian terns in this? Caspian, oh, okay. yeah. They're you outstanding. Can, yeah, you can you hear, the thing about them is you don't see them as me and I'm not, my eyesight's not what it was. I could hear them and right. they, they make such a raspy sound compared to the other terms. We're seeing Caspian and you've seen Caspian. Well, before. yeah, Caspian breed here. We've got the northernmost breeding colony where we've got over 400 pairs out of the copper, but uh, I'm not surprised that they're standing many. Yeah, not many, maybe two to four. Well, that's a, yeah, you give them a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's spring and fall, we get some around town and I've heard them through my closed office window, that raspy call uh, on occasion. Yeah. Yeah, it really perks you up when, I usually, when you're aware of it. That's how I usually can detect them. It's not that I see them a quarter mile out there, but I can hear them. Yeah, they're yeah. pterodactyl. Yeah, yeah, neat stuff. <laughs> so we try to, we keep a, <laughs> sorry guys, we keep a, a wildlife log and then keep track of all that stuff. And even down at the cook shack, we've got a big dry erase board. And we get some amazing visitors, like visitors from this town that are incredible birders or incredible plant folks. So we keep a list down there with the public too, and they're always updating that dry erase board, and it makes for some interesting viewing. Eagles, we see a a, quite a few eagles out there, uh, not near as many as I saw in the Tongass along the salmon stream, um, but I've seen up to 100 eagles at one time uh, in, in the lagoon, just counting those white heads, um, but um, not quite like when I was at Annan Creek, catch, you know, counting 150, 200, but um, we see quite a few at times. There's the group, it's a little dated photograph. You can see the plaid and the wool, <laughs> you know, but there's the group heading out uh, for a day of bear viewing. And the key to the success is just keeping the group together. So people often, the, some of the folks like to lag in the back and uh, stop and look at things. And all we ask is that they stop and, and stop us as well. So we stop as a group and look at things. But sometimes we get separated. We try not to become a segmented warm out there. We like to be one group out there and kind of move in a fluid way. And that way we have less impact when we're kind of threading the needle through some bears. And we try not to displace those bears or we try not to alter their behavior. And it really shows in the kind of viewing we see day to day, um, which is mostly bears ignore us quite a bit. Not entirely, but uh, that's what we're after. We, we want to be ignored and uh, makes for some great bear viewing when bears are not looking at you. They're just looking at other bears and, paying, and watching the fish. And that's what we're after is bears acting like bears in terms of not uh, being too, too focused on the human dimension. Now, in June, I mentioned the McFick area. This is my favorite time of the year is June. I love to watch bears out in McFick grazing the sedge. And what you can't see here is there's a creek that kind of meanders through the middle of the sedge flat. That's the east side of the flat, and the west side of the flat is kind of um, blocked by this landscape. But re a small red salmon run runs into McFick, a small alpine lake, uh, every June, about mid-June and so the bears fish for reds in there but they're also grazing there's a lot of mating going on with following going on so it's an interesting time of year not as many bears um, but very interesting with diverse behaviors so June is all about McFick Creek so we don't really go to McNeil River in June we don't go over to McNeil till maybe the last couple days of June or the first couple days of July when the chum start to come in to McNeil River tends to correspond with the first iris bloom. You know, you'll see that first iris bloom, you better start looking for chum, because they're, they're gonna start running up uh, McNeil. And so that's one of the reasons that so many bears come to this location, is you have two anadromous fish streams within about a half mile of each other. So they're very close, so you have all this fish in one place. And this picture is, shows McFick, and what we like to do is we like to go out in the flats and get a good distance from the creek, and just set up before the bears get there. And what's ideal is, is to have bears kind of come around and they'll come and fish in front of you, whereas you're not moving in toward them, they're moving toward you. 
and they're not really interested in us, they're really just moving toward the fish and the sedge. And if the group is really slow moving, not a lot of fast movements, uh, it makes for some great viewing because the bears really ignore you and just get caught up in their, their little sweet spot of grazing on that Carex limbii sedge and um, just behave like bears, which is kind of a neat thing to see out there. There's that sedge grass and they're always grinding that stuff up with those big molars back there. And it can be between 15 and 20% protein um, at a certain time of the year, right there when it's really robust in, in June. And by July, late July, it starts to wane. When it starts to turn yellow, late July and August, there's not a whole lot of, uh, of sedge grass being consumed. You know, they'll move on to other food sources. The following behavior is going on in June. Males are following females that are putting, they're in estrus and they're putting on a pheromone. And it makes for some interesting viewing because uh, you can have uh, a number of males um, vying for the attention of a given female and a lot of displacement and posturing going on and things of that nature. So it's a neat place to see behavior. But I'm going to keep this rolling because I have some clips I want to show you. Because stills are great, but they're not as expressive as uh, video clips. Um, so here's McFick Creek in the Riffles where uh, bears chase fish in this shallow area. It, it makes, uh, makes it challenging for fish to get up there because it's shallow water, and, um, but it's, it's where a lot of the bears fish at McFick, as well as further up to the right, uh, there's a lower and an upper falls. But you can kind of see that landscape back there. It's mostly alder and willow, and there are some poplar here and there, but uh, we don't have all these great trees you have here. It's kind of a windy spot. Here's the upper McFick at the upper falls, and you can see that creek is like a canyon. It's way down below, and the bears fish down there at um, the upper falls there. You, you see how we got that group fairly tight, uh, so there's no big gaps in the group. So if one bear chases another, you don't want a gap. You don't want a canyon, because uh, they might think about taking that canyon. And uh, so you can keep your group nice and tight and, and have a nice minimum distance from that uh, riparian system. Uh, the creek, uh, of course, it's, that's what's best. You don't want to be ever crowding the creek or right up on the creek because then you're pushing bears uh, in places you don't want to push them. It's nice to be back a ways and give them a little space. Do talk much? Um, they talk quite a bit when there's no bears in view. It's like a cocktail hour, and we have to be like the benevolent uh, person that says, oh, hey, guys, uh, bears are coming back in and uh, kind of calm down the cocktail hour effect. But usually when there's no bears in view, people chat up quite a bit. And when we're walking around, people chat. You know, it's great. We, we, you know, it's, make, it's good to make some noise, but maybe not real loud noises unless we have a concern. You know, so this is a female bear. You can see she's really even. And female bears are really hard to identify uh, one bear from the next because they're, so, they're often not very scarred up. We use the word clean. They're very clean. They don't often have a lot of scars unless they have a unique head shape. Um, but they can be difficult to, to um, identify, S and subadults as well, you know, because they're changing fast and they tend to be well furred and very clean, not many scars. Um, and uh, so they're hard to identify one bear from the next as well. Uh, there's some, they're challenging, but males are easier because, of course, they have more scars um, and they have broken claws and ripped ears, and there's a lot of uh, characteristics that are easier to track with these male brown bears. Um, and I did it again, sorry about that. Um, and so you can see how boxy this guy is. He's, he's quite a regular, so I recognize him. I've been watching this bear every year since I've, I arrived at McNeil. He's got a little scar there between his eyes. He's missing a right pinky claw. Um, but you see males have that big boxy head and their necks are as big as their heads. So it's really hard to keep a collar on a big brown bear. Just ask Charlotte. It's hard to keep those collars on those guys. Females are easier to keep the collars on because, of course, their necks are a little smaller than their heads. But a few bears that were collared up outside of McNeil out in the Kamishak special use area rolled in with just the ear tags and the collars had already been rubbed off um, with maybe one exception. That was a smaller male. Um, this male is quite distinctive because he's got his, his lower lip torn back a little bit. And um, he's... Uh, Quite a regular, but we see him coming a mile away because he kind of got a slack jaw, you know. So, um, but he catches fish. So a lot of those bears can have big rips and tears, and 
all kinds of injuries, but you know, as long as they're catching fish, they're ex incredibly resilient and they heal up very quickly. Uh, females that show up with new cubs or spring cubs, um, sometimes you see that acronym COY, it means cub of year. And so we see them show up a little bit later with those cubs. They might not show up until mid-June if we see some spring cubs in a given year. Um, these cubs can be with the sow two and a half or three and a half years. Um, so it just depends on the female. Of course, brown bears aren't as productive as black bears because they, of course, can, the cubs are with the sow for like two years, year and a half, two years, versus brown bears two and a half, three and a, three and a half years. Um, so these are called spring cubs or cubs of the year. And a, 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 if one of these bears was a year older, at 18 months, they'd be called a yearling. And sometimes that's misunderstood that people think that the spring cubs are yearlings because of the cub of the year can be a confusing concept. But in fact, yearlings are 18 months old in the summer. So, um, but even in the sedge grasses, when it looks like the coast is clear, you always have to be, hey bear, making some noise out there because bears can bed down on that sedge grass and it can get quite tall. And so you are always making a little noise out there. Um, so you're heard, just like you are here in Cor Cordova. Uh, what's that? Oh, we like, we clap, we clap, and we, we like human voice. But I'm a pro-noise guy. You know, people talk, are critical of bells and this and that. Um, I say noise is better than no noise, but human voice and clapping is very good. Do um, you have any suggestions? Or you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, cl the clapping seems to get their attention for some reason, that clap, clap, clap. Yeah, and if, if we're walking through a debris pile and we're walking on branches and branches crack, they're like, they're, they're that cracking noise, it must mean a bigger bear's coming because they, they're right on that really quickly. So, uh, um, so the big guns. So we see a lot of folks with the big guns. You see, we've got one of the camo boys here. You know, they come out, they got the camo tripod, and uh, they got those big cameras, right, Milo? They got those, yeah? And uh, so we see a lot of folks hunting with guns out there, and uh, it's become a, a popular pastime. We're seeing a lot of folks who are not professional photographers. It's just such a popular uh, hobby now. You know, that people get great photographs with, um, with the equipment. It's so good now. Um, so in a sense, we're, we see a lot of folks are serious amateurs that have websites or sell some photos, but they have a day gig, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they have a day job. Um, and there's only a handful of people we see that just make their living with photography now. You know, whereas 20 years ago, we saw a few more of those folks. Like a lot of the Alaska talk, stock photographers are not always, they also have a day job kind of thing. It's kind of interesting. But um, there, this is out of McNeil Pad. And so at McNeil, you're on the gravel pad, uh, eye level with bears. And, and that's great for folks like this that love wildlife and are okay, but um, with bears up close. But at the falls, we're, we're stuck at that one spot and we're pretty close to the river. And so bears come quite close to us there. And, and that's not, not okay for everybody. And that's perfectly okay. And so some people might be more comfortable up at Brooks or something on a platform and that's perfectly, perfectly okay. At McNeil, we're right on the ground with bears, so it's a, it's a little bit, um, it has a, a certain intensity to it. So just to kind of be forthright about that. Um, you can see the old film camera here, and uh, this is right on the edge of the, uh, of the pad as well. And so there's an upper pad and a lower pad, and we split the group, you know, up and down. So five and five, or six and four, and they're right on top of each other. So you're pretty, front and center there to all the activity there in the falls. And one of the reasons that so many bears can fish at McNeil Falls is because there's a lot of good fishing spots. Because that conglomerate is kind of kind of uh, broken up in such a way and spread out over uh, quite a, a, a wide area between the lower falls and the upper falls. So there's a lot of good places to fish. Um, you know, whereas um, say Brooks Falls, which is a great place to view bears, uh, managed by the National Park Service. But at the top of those falls, there's only so many places brown bears can stand, sit and catch those reds that jump. Well, these guys aren't facing so much downriver, with a few exceptions. They're facing upriver, because they're, they're fishing for chum. 
And what they do is they often wait for the chum to get up in the white water and they pin them or they, they kind of collapse on them. And there's a diversity of styles. We'll kind of get into that in a bit. Um, so you can kind of get a, uh, that's the center rock right there. And, you know, previous to 1973, when the, the sanctuary was designated in 67 by the state legislature, um, you know, there were people coming out here and doing some uh, pretty wild activities. There's a picture pre-1973 with a, uh, a videographer on the center rock <laughs> surrounded by bears. And there were some researchers out there uh, through Utah State University at that time. And um, they were out there for, oh, five, four, five, six years. And they were kind of under direct supervision of a guy named Jim Farrow, who was the area biologist out of King Salmon at that time, who, um, who deserves a good deal of credit uh, to do with designating the sanctuary. Jim thought McNeil was special, and we could do a lot of, um, a lot of research there, and people could view bears and we could manage all the nines around that area. And so Jim didn't like what he was hearing and he thought someone was gonna get hurt. So in 1974, he, he sent his best tech out there, a guy named Walt Cunningham, and he said, every group has to go with Walt. And so they went to the 10 a day with one technician in 1974, and it's worked out really well from that time. Uh, Larry came on in 76, um, but Larry, Larry, Larry Allmiller had been working for Fishing Game prior to that. Um, out, of the, out of the King Salmon office. Um, but he, he had been in other places like Round Island and working for Sportfish. Um, so he came over here in 76 and he thought, he, he's told me, he thought he'd stay a season or two and he stayed 30 years. So good stuff, we're really fortunate to have ha that happen. Um, combat fishing is when those bears, come, just like kind of like the Russian, they're lining up out there side by side. But it's not a team strategy. These bears are not playing the zone. They're, they're, they're each bear is out for themselves. You know, they're competing, but what these big bears often have to do is they have to habituate to one another. You've heard of the term habituation, which means a lack of, of response to an inconsequential stimuli, okay, which is confused often with food conditioning, by the way. Habituation is separate from food conditioning, and so these bears are habituating to one another. They're having a lack of response. Whereas typically, when there's just a handful of bears out there, they spread out. But when there's 50 bears, they kind of have to get close to one another to catch fish. But those are mostly all big males out there fishing side by side. And here's our little human group. We got our Coleman chairs out there. And uh, some people choose to sit down. I'm on the far left there in that green uh, fishing game jersey. And you can kind of see how bears come around us um, here and there. Um, and you know, get a little perspective there on size. That's a probably a good 800 pound bear right there. Um, but bears move right around us. They catch fish and sometimes they drag them up into these tussocks. And that's where they'll eat the fish because if they, if they eat that fish down in that one of those rocks, they might um, lose their fish to another bear. So there's a lot of fish thievery going on out there with the rank and hierarchy of the males. So we see a lot of that out there. Um, those bears do have fish fever. They're like we are. They're, they're really uh, focused on those fish. And when they get satiated, some of the big bears will just sleep right there on the conglomerate. Um, you know, oh, I went one too fast. But I'll kind of get into fishing styles. One of the common fishing styles is to kind of belly flop or I kind of like hole displacement. If you weigh a thousand pounds and you just rear up on your feet and you just displace a whole bunch of water, if there's fish down there, you know, you might just stun a fish for a split second, and that's just enough to pin it with one of those big pads. And that, that stun is just that quick slam, and that works really well. You see that, bears do that quite a bit. You know how at, at, at Brooks, they're, they, they're catching the, the fish in midair with their mouths. We don't really see that at McNeil, because those chum aren't often midair. They're usually just, just in the water, just coming over the surface of the water. But they're a big chum, eight to eight to twelve pound chum. They're good size. I and by the way, they're great eating. I eat chum all summer. Um, but um, let's see. This uh, this this bear's been submarining, and a lot of bears. This is McFit Creek. They'll go under the water, look around, and kind of move around down there, and then they might pop up and belly flop onto some fish. Uh, so the snorkeling is big. Aggression, you see some aggression here and there, like this bear on the right's got uh, fish blood on his mouth, and that's probably over a piece of salmon right there. But when bears are closely ranked or closely sized, 
and they're hungry, uh, things get a little intense. And so they might really struggle for who has who by just a quarter click in terms of rank and hierarchy. And once that's established, it makes it easier uh, throughout the summer. And you might be able to mo monopolize one fishing spot over another based on your rank and hierarchy. Um, you kind of see who can displace who throughout the summer. Oh, there was again. Sorry. I don't know if I'm just waiting out long enough or not. There's just another picture like the last one. You can see those canines and incisors, and you can't see the molars in there. Uh, but um, they can be quite vociferous at times as well. And you can get some, uh, I'd love to get some good audio of the different sounds they make. Um, kind of like they have on that show Encounters, if you need to get some audio of the, all the sounds, the, the popping and the huffing and the woofing, and it would be neat to actually hear those sounds on, a, on an audio tape. Can, can you just, maybe I'll forward that one more time and see if I, there you go. Some bears are quite easy to distinguish because of their characteristics, like this, these white claws. A lot of bears have white claws, but this bear has very ivory claws, so he's very easy for us to ID. And again, he'll, uh, he'll start to take that, that uh, fish apart. And if it's a, a female fish, that row is so <laughs> sacred for these guys. They really will lick up every single one of those eggs. And of course, that, that skin, the tail, the row, and the brains is something they really go after. When the catch rates are, are high, they do high grade. You know, they'll start to take the row and the brains and the skin. And, you know, the carcass or, or might just float down into the deep pool. But the minute those catch rates slow down, they'll actually dive down to the bottom of that pool right out in front of the falls and dip up these carcasses, right, just like they're in the refrigerator. And they'll just eat these weak old carcasses until they're gone. Uh, they, they really do. So the concept of waste is a little crazy, too, because in a sense, one bear will chase another bear, and they'll drop a, a carcass up somewhere. And we're talking about how all of this decomposition um, is a great deal of nitrogen that's going into the system out there, and therefore uh, making that flora robust. And as you w know well here in Cordova, you live in such a rich environment. Um, you know, it's, it's important to have a little, in these riparian areas, to have those, those fish kind of carcasses dragged around. And bears are big spreaders. They're spreading stuff all over, along with a lot of berry seeds and everything else. So um, let me see. I don't know if that's going to do it. Oh, there we go. Another of the same. I might just move over here, there, yeah. Um, and again, you see the carcass to the right that's, that's sitting there, and this guy's working on another fish. And what also will happen is one of these big bears will, will go back to the fishing hole and leave a carcass, and a juvenile that's up in a tussock will run down, grab a carcass, like that carcass right there, and run. And he's probably going to eat the brains and the gill plate and a whole lot of stuff like that. We don't see a whole lot of waste out there. Um, but... Um, you see him pulling the skin off in the, in the tail as well here. These big gashes like on that male, that, that's not a big deal for these males. They're amazing uh, how resilient they are. Uh, we'll see this little fleshy spot heal right up. And, you know, a matter of months later, it, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal to these guys. Um, they come out of that water, and you can see their saliva flying and when they shake off. So it's kind of interesting to watch them day in, day out. Um, yeah, sometimes you, you don't want to get sprayed. They're, uh, they can really project that quite a way. Uh, here's a female bear. She's starting to shed out. You can see her head is shed, and she still has a um, well-furred body, and she's got a big chum. You get an idea how big those chum are. And those are mostly glaucus wing gulls flying around. There's mew gulls and glaucus wing gulls flying around uh, this particular area. And those big bears get really satiated and just sleep right there in the center of the river. This is that big bear. I, I recognize him. He's missing that pinky claw on the right-hand side. Uh, I saw a picture of him earlier as well. And those scars, like on that nose, those are distinguishing characteristics that we see um, on individuals. And we try to make note of those scars when we track individuals. And with digital photography, we've been just making a, a file for these bears that we see year after year because the digital photographs are pretty easy to download and click and drag. Unlike the, the film days where you'd have to send the film out and get it back, 
now it's instant. You can kind of put your pictures right there in a file. There's Larry Allmiller. And uh, we, we go out at the end of the spit and try to get a little dinner periodically. Um, so we try to find a little chum or a red salmon or late in the season, if we're lucky, get a coho. And uh, we're, as long as the fish is bright, we're, we're pretty open-minded about fish in a field camp. So it's nice to get a little fish. Um, you can see that tail. The bears will eat the whole fish and, and also eat the tail of the fish as well. Um, and quite dexterous. They can really hold on to those fish. They're, they're, they're so strong. I couldn't hold on to a fish like that. It'd get away from me. But uh, they, uh, they can really hang on to those fish. It's amazing. Sometimes they get away. We're always looking at, at uh, bear's body language and what's going on. You know, if you see a bear that's kind of frothy, we're paying close attention. This bear's frothed up, a big male, uh, because there's another big male nearby that's posturing and, and rubbing and displaying. So there's uh, these, these bears communicate through this body language, and we get to see a lot of it, which is pretty neat. We call this the stink eye. If, uh, if a bear really gives you a hard look somewhere, it's not, I'm not trying to say that we're in danger, but we'll, if they're, t they're, playing, they're paying close attention to us, if we're moving, we'll just stop and stand still. Because mostly it's if, if people are moving too fast, a bear will look at you. But if you're not really moving a lot, you just become part of the landscape. In, in a viewing sense, with a group of people, that works out great with a group of 10 people. But if people are moving around and they get excited and they want to dive in their pack, like back in the film days, they dive in for another roll of film and that movement could be too much. So we always have to try to train people to move slow and, and don't be a wedding photographer. I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but uh, no fast movements. Play bouts are, are one of my favorite uh, behaviors to watch and uh, they're just a lot of fun. And when bears are really satiated, um, you see a lot more play. When they're hungry, you don't see too much play. They've got to get a few fish under their belt, and then you might see some bipedal play activity, especially in the water. The big males, are it's easier to, be, to get up on your hind legs and be bipedal in water than on uh, you know, dry land. Uh, so you'll see the big guys get up a little bit more in the water. And that's what I have for my little slideshow. But I, what I brought for you today is I brought some, uh, some nice uh, little video clips that are a little bit more expressive of some behaviors. And uh, I'd like to share those with you here. Um, and I, and I want to give credit to a few people. These video clips, clips I don't own, but um, <clears throat> they've been shared with me um, by a few folks. Um, some of these video clips were <clears throat> filmed by the... Um, the folks out at UAA, they're putting together a documentary at the University of Alaska. Um, the uh, old visualization theater, they're putting together an educational program and they've been out filming uh, a few times. So they've gotten some good stuff, but, but you see those stills, but it doesn't really quite capture, you know, the energetics involved with these fishing bears in the whitewater. This is a female bear that we see on a regular basis, and she is very talented fishing bear. She's, she can keep up with the boys any day of the week in terms of how many fish she can get. Oh, it's probably hard to say, you know, 50-50. Females are hard on females. Um, so you'll, we'll just see one female chase another female, uh, you know, just because of competition. Uh, but it's hard to say if, uh, what percentage of scars are from females versus males? Oh, yeah, I usually say clean when I'm referring to bears that aren't scarred up. This is a pretty clean female. Okay. She's very distinctive to me though because her head shape is distinctive. She does have that freshie there by her eye. Right. We call that a freshie. And, but that'll heal up in a matter of a week or two, and you won't even see that. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, she, she shed out. Yeah, that's, this is late season, like in July. And by late July, they get really shed out. The females generally stay, they stay well for longer. And the males, when they get shed out, they, get, they rub, and they have these big, big rub patches. And the females, when they shed out, they might not have so many rub spots. Like that, that female's coat, in my mind, is very even. Um, but yeah, that might, might be what he's talking about. But sexing bears is, uh, we'll get into that in just a minute, but you can kind of see this submarining style. 
This is that big male that we've seen quite a bit of. He's a, quite a regular at McNeil Falls. And he'll just disappear under the water for, you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds. He's a big submariner. But, uh, and, and he works all the angles. Some bears just kind of work specific styles. Um, it's like he's just doing a little check-in down there, see what's going on. Uh, but you can see what I mean about the video clips. They're a little bit more expressive than the stills. Um, so again, I don't own these clips. They were lent to me by uh, the University of Anchorage, uh, University of Alaska at Anchorage. I'll just say one thing. I don't feel I have a relationship with any of these bears. That none of these bears have a relationship with us humans. They have maybe other bears. But what, you know, habituation, they're very tolerant of us. And if we travel in group size, and we use good discretion, we've proven that we can be very safe. But we also have to be very vigilant. That's why we like low staff turnover at McNeil. We, like, we, want, we want people who have been out there a long time and uh, have good common sense. Um, but I'll leave it at that. You know, I don't really, um, yeah, I'm, the other stuff gets. <laughs> no, we, no. No, 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 no we, we use human language that we're, we look big. But we're no, by no means trying to replicate what bears do. Yeah, no, no. We're clearly human. We want them to think we're human, you know, whatever that is, you know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, 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 no. But, uh, but speaking of bear language, what's kind of neat about Charlotte's saying, just kind of watch this now. These are males, and there's a, a dominant male here in the front, and a little bit of a recessive male right behind him, but these two males appear to have a rapport. And this guy's very careful about the way he's moving back a little bit because there's a third bear you can't see. But he's going to pivot right back in there. Um, so bears appear to have rapport. And some bears don't like each other. And some bears seek each, out, seek each other out for play. And we can, you'll see some of that here because this is even kind of a playful demeanor. Um, between two males that are probably satiated. They've had a lot of salmon. There's not much competition there. And, um, but you don't see any real aggression right there. And uh, a third bear walks in from behind, and you'll see these subtle nuances. Like this bear's going to back up just a little bit. Uh, oh, he stopped. Sorry. Thought about that step. Stopped. Just careful. Look. Both, both ways here. So all these subtle body language things are going on all the time. It's like slow motion. It is. So. And the one in the back is the largest. I think this guy in the front line is a little bit bigger, but he's well furred. The one in the back is really well furred. He looks big. Um, so, but just interesting when you see these, these, uh, these little clips here and there. But, uh, so is there more um, aggression at the beginning of the season? You know, there's more aggression if there's a reason for the aggression of females that are vying for the, you know, for the same estrus female. Mm -hmm. Or you have bears that are not catching a lot of fish. And a bear catches a fish and, you know, sometimes they'll really go after that resource. Mm -hmm. Or there's just bears that just don't seem to really like each other at all. It's really it's interesting. But mostly it's uh, conflict, at least in our perception of conflict, these are, of course, our perceptions, and we're not bears. Um, but it seems as though bears avoid conflict a lot by using body language, posturing, huffing, popping, rubbing, scenting. They do a lot of different things where they can just posture and kind of resolve potential conflict. So, uh, so yeah, you'll see stuff like that. But let me uh, show you a couple more clips here. Um, just kind of a little bit. This clip is lent to me uh, by, this one is actually, oops, is actually on YouTube, and a guy named um, uh, Wayne Hall lent it to me, and he's been out in the video several times, and he's very generous with his video clip. But here's a relaxed bear out of Mixic, and it's all by itself. Uh, And just to show you how uh, dexterous they are, he, he'll, I think this bear picks up a stick. He's reaching around for a stick down there. And 
and uh, they love to wallow around in that mud. So, so this is where mixtape is my favorite. Mixtape's a little bit more laid back, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> you'd almost think it'd be the opposite. This is early in the season, right? When they, they, there's not as much fish around. Well, there's fish in this stream, okay. um, so um, so this bear is wallowing around. There's uh, probably caught a few salmon. Dogs and grazing them can set grasses. So again, when you're satiated, things are good. So. Does the colonization of bears look the same? Really high. I mean, I've, I've been a lot of places that had a lot of bears. Is it is it really higher than other places, or is it just it's real high in plus and it's in plus stuff and then you get into it? How do you come back away from that? Why is it so good? Right, like if, if you're, it depends on what kind of range finder and uh, what kind of uh, range we're talking about. But McNeil, if you were looking at discrete boundaries between the lower falls and the upper falls, to have 80 bears in view at one time is a world nowhere else on the planet. But it doesn't mean you can hold bear. You have a nice, divorce scope and see 80 bears on a flat. With a really high power strip. So with McNeil, you have a big test in a matter of several hundred yards. Mm -hmm. So that's what's that kind of make it out kind of kind of what they're going to. But there, there are, yeah. This is gonna be a little mixed piece out here, so when is the worst computer in the period? Yeah, just when the wind doesn't blow. And uh, mm -hmm. you know it's, it's I would say mid June, mid July, you're right on with that. But uh, you know, most of the wind will wide open in Kansas that day, and it's a cold place. The wind blows there. And in the middle of, we normally are, I rarely wear shorts before this summer. Um, so bears are, are so uh, tolerant, you know, over years, we're very careful with that one group a day. So they'll lay down and nurse in front of you sometimes. And it sounds like an outboard, like a little 15 horse, like a kind of like an outboard thing. Back at us. Make sure no one's moving back there. And they see the ears. It's fun to watch their ears in a time lapse and see their ears moving around directionally. How many months do they Oh, they're nursing as long as they're with the cubs. It's just that the frequency of the nursing changes drastically. You know, at this, at when they're spring cubs, they can be nursing every two to four hours. Yearlings less frequent, and then two and a half twice a day, you know, not that frequent. So the frequency changes, but as long as the, the cubs are with the sow or the female, excuse me, they're, they're usually nursing until they're actually at that stage where they're starting to separate and they're spending time apart. She has six teeth, and they're rotating teeth to teeth is what they're doing. And a, a typical nursing bout is about three minutes. That's it, about three minutes. So when it happens, it's like, everybody better be in position. You've got three minutes, and then it's over. So it doesn't last long. It looks, the females seem to avoid coming in when the males are there. You see that here? Is there a lot of avoidance? At McNeil Falls, mm -hmm. except for the really high-ranking females. Mm -hmm. But at Nixit, not so much. But at McNeil, you do. And, uh, Here's a, a big female um, that we see every year, and she's easy for us to distinguish because she's got a, a claw on her front right pad that's bent up, kind of ratcheted up. And she's a really large female, probably 600 pounds, and uh, she's grazing that Terex lingui right there. See that claw on the right that's kind of ratcheted up there, on, on the left, excuse me. There's a belly bed right in front of her, and they dig those beds out in the sand. I'm sure you see them in this area too, and they put their bellies right into that big depression right there. 
this female has two big cubs with her, and you're going to see a great play sequence in just a minute. Uh, they're two two-and-a-half-year-old cubs, so they're quite large. Watch this nose. Oh, I guess it didn't match. Yeah, there was like a quivering nose shot. Yeah. an everyday play bout, but every now and then you get lucky and you get a great play bout. How old are these babies now? These are two and a half year olds. nursing in there. They, you see them eating more and more as they get older of other food sources. So one of these cups is a male and one's a female, but uh, hard to tell which is which, isn't it? Yeah. Are you able to track relationships between siblings as they get older? Only if there's distinguishing characteristics, like a really unique scar. But if we don't have those characteristics, uh, when they were with the, the family group, we do with one pair. because she's got such a brand on her nose. If there's no real brand, it's hard to try. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask if they were more tolerant or less tolerant. <laughs> well, the females, you'll see these younger bears, four, five and a half year old bears trying to get close to these sows and cubs. Like they're, you think it might be the sow. He keeps laying down and the sow will run them off. He's got new coys. Um, so we see, and we think that that sometimes that one that's trying to keep trying to get closer to the family group, like a five and a half to two right there, or something, maybe that was the offspring. So. Do you ever do any tagging or um, we, we don't. We don't tag bears. We don't handle bears. Um, but Derek Stonoroff, who worked out of New York for about a decade, had rubbing posts and collected hair on individuals that. And he was very good with the ID. He had, been, uh, he had did his graduate work out there in 1970, 71, 72. Derek's really high level. And uh, yeah. he had collected hair samples. But the, the testing of the DNA, you have to, uh, you know, we couldn't pay, we wouldn't pay for that with a uh, public funding source because it's, it's not a management issue. You know what I mean? So if there was a university or, you know, a graduate class where there was funding external of the state, that might be a consideration. But it wouldn't be good practical use of state funds, you know.
So this bout went on for almost two hours one day. <laughs> so, yeah, it was off and on, but it was it kept going. And uh, oh boy, boy, the BBC would love to have that, wouldn't they? <laughs> Come back and get a little few few bites of that sedge right there. You can see how early season this is because it hasn't greened up much on the hillside behind camp. So, but uh, every day we do walk out there and we you know we kind of you get a sense of just uh, how special it is out there at McNeil. Um, we're just really fortunate to uh, to see that day in day out. Um, so we just guide that group out there, um, just, uh, you know, uh, our group of 10. And uh, so you just have to be a good walker. Um, and that means walking on uneven terrain and hip boots and mud. And uh, just to give you an idea, um, so anybody who's a good walker and can sit outside with layers on all day, it's a, a great way to spend the day. We're out, we leave at about 10, 10.30 in the morning. And we watch bears till about seven o'clock at night, so it's a long day out there. Um, and you see, everyone's got their hippers. And so, uh, if you have good balance and get a walking stick, and uh, here we're we're traveling with our Crazy Creek chairs because we're going to sit down at the mouth of the river and watch bears uh, down at Ender's Island, a place at the mouth of the river. This is at the mouth of McNeil. There are these little I islands out there. And in August, it's kind of a carcass fishery. And we go down to the mouth and watch bears in August. Um, so it's a little more laid back, not as many bears. But it's still kind of a special area. Of course, on a sunny day like this, it is. <laughs> so. Oh, no, we, uh, we bring lots of food with us. Yeah, we, we sit down, we, we keep our food with us. We just ask people when they're they're breaking out their snacks and their plastic bags to to make sure they don't blow away. You know that's the big thing. So we're kind of constantly coaching folks to make sure and zip that up and put it away uh, so it doesn't because if it blows out in the river we can't get it. But no, we eat right in front of bears. Um, seems counterintuitive, but very simply, it's an amazing thing. You have to see it to believe it. If bears have not received food rewards from you, they do not seek food rewards from you. It's these bears that get you know food from us in garbage or bird seed or dog food or cat food or what have you that start to associate that there could be a food reward <laughs> and that's where things uh, generally are, are very bad. And that's one reason I, I do go around to schools and try to talk to young people and, and uh, adults uh, is be, because we do have a problem in Anchorage and it's a slippery slope once they get that easy bird seed, easy trash, they're going to be back again and again and a lot, a lot of many times they have to be euthanized so it's a difficult scenario um, but I want to say if you back to McNeil for a second if you want to come out to McNeil you just apply on the uh, state website you go to a fishing gate where well, you go to alaska.gov and you can probably query it in the upper right hand corner type in McNeil River and you can apply you have to apply by uh, before or by March 1st and it's a $25 fee per name in the lottery that's not refundable and it kind of designates that you're serious uh, just because once we issue you a permit um, it's difficult to do resales and things of that nature and so um, that's when the, the lottery closes and in-state permit is $150 for residents for the four days and the, mo the biggest expense is to fly from Homer to McNeil round trip and roughly uh, a round trip flight that means a, a drop off and a pickup a week later that runs about $700 from Homer. And um, the seat fare is, 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 if you know about what planes cost, that's actually a pretty good deal. Because uh, charter, to charter an aircraft is quite a bit more money. Um, but that's, uh, that lottery runs, uh, those four day, they're four day permits, they run, there's 20 four day blocks. They run from June 7th through August 25th. Um, a block would be like June 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you pick your top four 
time frames and uh, you'll find out a matter of uh, weeks later and then you start making your arrangements. Yeah, you can put up to a maximum of one, um, up, to, up to three people on a permit. So a permit can have one name, two names, or three names, but it's going to be $25 per name. So like a couple would be $50, and that's not refundable. Um, now, if you win and you can't go, you just don't purchase. And, and you, that was a deadline that we have to receive those receipts by. And if we don't receive those receipts, we will resale. We'll go to the next person. We'll go to number 11 on that list and we ring them up but we like to do that with enough time so they can make arrangements um, but um, the initial money is not refundable uh, if you look at the odds where it gets very difficult to draw a permit is is in July uh, peak season there like say early to mid to late July is, is very challenging odds wise um, we actually kind of show that in, on the website and in McFick in June it's a little easier and after, in August, it's quite a bit easier. But August is a really different experience. There's not as many bears in view, and you have to be patient. Um, there's periods of no bears, you know, you might, whereas, uh, so, you know, there's different time frames. Now, some people just love McFick, some people love August, and it's, it, the later you go, the easier it is to draw. But I will remind you, by the time we leave on T, which is August 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, it's, there's uh, just a handful of bears around. There's not that many bears by that. We, we end the lottery when we run out of bears, and the bears move on. They don't live in the sanctuary. They're just there to feed at that critical habitat, and then they move right back out. You know, so if that answers your question. But the most difficult time to pull a permit is in July, like in the mid, like the probably peak season these days is July 13, 14, 15, 16 for numbers of bears. And so in early July, it jumps right up there, and then it wanes on the other side. Uh, so it just really depends on what your schedule is and what you want to see. Uh, but four, you, you pick your top four, um, and they, they, they'll, so you're really in four lotteries. So if you don't win your first selection, you still might. And then some people put in to be standby, and standby permits do very well. And that's just what it is, it's a standby. And they, well, no, you actually have a legitimate standby permit, and, um, and you fly out there, and you are standby. And sometimes a spouse doesn't show, or in a typical permit of two or three people, you'll have uh, one person that's really gung-ho, and you'll have two people who are fair-weather bear viewers, and they go out on a sunny day, and they're going to sit back and read a, a book and camp and watch binoculars through, your, through the binoculars at camp, and then the, the standbys go. But I want to say thanks so much for inviting me out here today. And I have some uh, bear safety information back there on that desk. And I want to thank Charlotte Westing for inviting me. She uh, organized it so that I could come out and talk to the school. And it was a, a kind of a, a wonderful thing because I, I've, I've never been to Cordova before. I've always wanted to come here. And it reminds me of, of when I lived in southeast Alaska. And uh, so it's, you guys are really lucky. It's really a special place. And, uh, and I haven't seen that much of it, but it's pretty, pretty neat. What a great community. So thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.